We are proud members of the Spy Podcast Network. Find out more at www.spypodcasts.com. Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. His story started many years before when he was relentlessly bullied at school to the point that he wanted to take his own life or, 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 or take their lives. And I think that sometimes we have to take away the political labels from people and just see people for individuals as well. Lock your doors. Close the blinds. Change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. On today's podcast, I'm joined by Nick Lowells from Hope Not Hate. On this episode, we take a look at the work of Hope Not Hate and how they uncovered a far-right plot to murder Labour MP Rosie Cooper. That plot was thankfully foiled and has now been turned into an ITV drama called The Walk-In. Just before we begin, we now have a YouTube channel. I've been threatening it for a while and now we have it. So please follow the link below in the show notes and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And there are video versions of the podcast. So if you like to see a squiggly line with your interviews, you can now see a squiggly line on YouTube. If you wish to support the podcast, there are a few options for you. You can become a Patreon subscriber and directly support the show for £3 a month. We also have a merchandise store at Redbubble. We have cups, coasters, water bottles and tote bags all available on the Redbubble store. Also, if you enjoy this episode, please share it on social media among friends, family, colleagues, cohorts. And lastly, please leave a review on your podcast app. All reviews help the show get discovered by other people. Apple Podcasts in particular love reviews and they really help this show get featured on the app. So please do leave a review. All the links are available in the show notes below. Thank you so much for your support. And without further ado, let's get going. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Nick, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. I've been a listener for a long time, so it's great to be on the show. Yes, yeah, well, thank you so much for coming on. It is great to have you on. Yeah, we've spoken a couple of times, I think, offline. It's nice to finally be able to have a chat with you. So for the benefit of listeners who may or may not know much about you, please can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Nick Lowells. I'm the CEO of Hope Not Hate, which is an anti-fascist, anti-extremist organisation. Um, I helped founded it in, I helped set it up in... Um, 2011 even though we'd been using the name for several years before i'd originally got involved with searchlight the anti-fascist magazine back in the late 80s um and um yeah so been been running hope not hate for um 10 11 years now fantastic and what was it that sort of inspired you kind of to get into this this sort of type of work i mean i think it's going back to my childhood my mother um was born in Mauritius and she came over to England in 1961 and growing up in Hounslow in the 1970s I kind of she experienced racism and I guess I experienced her experiencing racism and that had a huge impact on me um, I remember I got brought up in a political household I remember the 1979 National Front party political broadcast now you know I was just a, a young kid and I had no concept of how big or small or how relevant they were but I remember watching this political broadcast saying that they would send home kind of non-white people who weren't bo born in Britain within six months of coming to power and you know this 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 kind of haunt, haunted me I bet. Yeah. when in in the late 80s um, I, I was politically active involved in anti-racism and everything but um in the late 80s 1988 i met jerry gable who was um then well, was the uh, publisher of searchlight magazine and um 
Searchlight had been established in the kind of 1960s and a long-standing kind of research operation. And their specialization was infiltration, um, trying to get information. I mean, obviously, this is pre-internet days, so whereas now a lot of material is online, public access, open access, back then, uh, where the far right was more violent and more kind of marginalized, you had to be inside these organizations. And and I guess that's what I began to specialize in. And, you know, we've carried that on in Hope Not Hate at any one time. We might have between 15 and 20 sources inside the far right giving us information on a regular basis. Wow. And over the last kind of 20 years, I've probably handled and run between 160 and 180 informants inside far right yeah. groups. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Can you just tell us a bit more about sort of what Hope Not Hate is? I hope our hate is, is it's an anti-fascist, anti-extremist organisation, but we really the idea behind it came because after the riots in 2001 in Burnley, Oldham, in Bradford, where I guess the kind of the notion that multiculturalism was working and multiracialism was working well in Britain was kind of kind of exploded a bit, and and I think that you know in many parts of the country there were segregated communities. We then had 9-11 and we had the kind of political rise of, 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 of the BNP. And, um, and that, um, that, that, that made me and, and others kind of aware that traditional anti-fascism was, wasn't working. Um, you know, that it was really dominated by the hard left. It was really focused on kind of confrontation. It was, it was town center based, you know, and, rallies and and in a way me and others kind of felt we needed to go into communities we needed to kind of win hearts and minds it wasn't just good enough doing the research but but we had to kind of explain why extremism and far-right extremism was wrong we had to provide alternative answers to people and many people were angry about things and i think the the whole ethos of hope not hate is basically distilled into three points we are there to monitor, disrupt and oppose the organised far right. We're there to engage in the communities that are susceptible to the far right. But then we're also there to address some of the issues that give rise to the far right. So Hope Not Hate still does its research work, still does its infiltration, but we also do a lot of stuff in schools. We do a lot of stuff in community work, policy work, because you know we understand that in a way, Someone being involved in the far right is the end of the journey. Generally, mm, you know, mm. it, you know, really, what we and what society needs to do is to kind of figure out how do we stop people going, going, going there in the first place. So, you know, I, but I think that gives hope, not hate, its strength. It's not just research. It's not just education. Um, that we draw on the kind of aspect, all, all the different aspects of our work. Yeah, yeah, and you do it. From what I've seen, you're doing fantastic work. So well done. Thank you. What I'd like to do today is have a sort of chat a bit about the far right in the UK. Um, and later on, we'll have a chat about the plot to murder Labour MP Rosie Cooper, which has become the subject of a of an ITV drama called The Walk-In, which um, I finally finished watching and really, really enjoying. And I uh, have a few questions about that. So, um, so we'll go back to the beginning. I'd love to just chat a bit about sort of the far right itself. So have you, are you able to kind of give us a, a kind of rough guide to the British far right today and the kind of the threat that they represent in society? Sure. I mean, I, I think it's probably it's worth saying that the far right as a term is both probably quite broad and yeah. probably quite elastic. You yeah. know, people have different opinions of how they how they define far right. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, for us, there are there are huge differences between different elements of the far right. And sometimes they're actually quite opposed to each other. But there are certain com common themes um, and whether it's about. Um, it's the primary concern around race, immigration, and, and and identity, and often that can be displayed in kind of nationalism or exceptionalism, um, and 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 normally the kind of the idea about a race of people or a a nation being a geographic nation being 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 better or preserving a purity. But I, I, I think I think, you know, and, and generally there's an in group and an out group, you know, so the far right is very good kind of demonizing the outsider, be it be it, you know, immigrants or the, you know, be it be it um, is Islam and, and, and Muslims of late. I think that the 
difficulty for us, and I, I think the difficulty for many people, is that the far right is changing a lot and it's morphing. When I first started in the late 80s, early 90s, the far right was very marginalized in society. Uh, they're very separate. It was skinheads. It was, you know, the political wing of the football hooligan world. It was street fighting. It was pure racism, send the immigrants back. And in a sense of they were what, what it, it said on the tin in a way. Uh, whereas, whereas now, I think partly post 9-11, We've had a growing element of the far right that has adopted not racist views, but anti-Muslim views and anti-Islam. Islam is a supremacist ideology. It's trying to take over. We we need to fight it. Muslims in Britain are the kind of fifth column. Um, but I also think it's the reality of, you know, 40, 50 years of immigration into Britain. I mean, back in 1999, the British National Party, which was, you know, run by Holocaust deniers and run by Hit Hitler worshippers, even they admitted that it was now impossible to have a kind of send the blacks back policy because actually you're now dealing with three generations of British black people, um, and even many of their own voters wouldn't wouldn't support that sort of thing. So, I mean, I th I think the far right has morphed a lot, and I think most worryingly. The boundaries, the kind of cordon sanitaire has kind of broken away and it's become blurred. And and I think a lot of the kind of ideas that are increasingly coming over from the US, some of the culture war stuff, um, you know, stuff around critical race theory and the anti-trans stuff. And, you know, it's blurring the distinctions between the traditional far right and in a way the conservative far right and conservative with, with a small C rather than necessarily a big C. But also, I think a new change in the last couple of years has been COVID. Um, and I think, you know, the rise of, you know, COVID conspiracies. Um, and obviously, once you start going down the rabbit hole of conspiracies, you know, you tend to all end up in the same place. But also the antitrust element to it and anti, um, you know, anti-government. And I think one of the things that's really concerning us at the moment, particularly amongst younger people, you know, Britain has over, young people in Britain have overwhelmingly been kind of more tolerant, more liberal, more open-minded than both their older generations, but even their peers in other uh, Western European countries. That's starting to change. And obviously people are still kind of massively anti-racist, but they're taking on elements of, particularly in the conspiracy world, some of this anti-authority, um, you know, secret, secret cabals organising society. And I think some of the distinctions, some of the political ideologies that were quite fixed in the kind of, you know, 70s and 80s and 90s are now getting increasingly blurred where because of the internet, people are picking and choosing. People are picking this little bit of ideology from here or these views from here. So there's a incoherency on one level but actually i think this is this is the modern world we're facing and it, it makes our job more difficult but also i think you know whether it's for governments and others trying to figure out what is the balance between free speech and hate speech what is you know what's acceptable opposition to authority and what's not acceptable opposition you know uh, so i i, I think it, it's it's a, it's increasingly more complex i'm sorry that's a very long winded no, it's good and and answer to your question but i think you know it, the reality is the far right is far more, um, you know, dispersed than it probably was 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, number one, long wind is good. I mean, I, I've nearly, I, I think I've had the record on this show is nearly two hours and 45 minutes for an episode. So, so don't feel you're being too long. Um, you know, the deep dive's good. So uh, that's good. But um, one thing, a couple of things. Um, I noticed, so, uh, you mentioned a sort of conspiratorial view um, is sort of growing a bit. And I've certainly, uh, prior to COVID, QAnon and Trumpism were sort of very much a big thing that I'd noticed online that were, I, so I, 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 I think you may notice, you may not. I used to be a conspiracy theorist in my very early 20s and I, I, was, um, I was sort of into 9-11 conspiracism and made friends in that world and then slowly over time realised that that was, nonsense and um 
And the funny thing is that so what I find found from moving away from a group like that was that you still have these sort of weird friendships with these people, but over time you find the friendships don't work anymore because you don't believe what they mm. believe. But I was still loosely in touch with a few people. And I had one friend in particular who was the most sort of um I, how do I put it? It was sort of the archetypal sort of hippie type character. I remember when the Iraq war happened, we went and filmed a video about sort of giving out flowers for peace. He was that kind of guy. But by 2016, 17, he had become a sort of QAnon Trump supporter. You know, he's based in the UK, but he was sort mm. of a Trump supporter ideologically. Mm. And um, he had changed a lot. And I, I was just shocked that this guy who was giving out flowers for peace in 2002, 2003, sort of turned into this sort of Trump supporter. Um, so there is definitely something going on. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and can I just say on that? Hmm. I mean, I think, you know, that that isn't that um, um, unusual now. I mean, it was interesting because I went out on some of the kind of early um cons- anti-lockdown demos in london and you know obviously this is we you know you're not meant to be out on the street and you know you, there were like ten thousand people in trafalgar square or whatever oh, yeah, yeah. and it was really fascinating because i went there to kind of look at you know i'd seen this stuff online and everything but i'd gone i went down to have a look and and it was this really weird mix of kind of you know new age hippies with kind of you know survivalists to you know people into yoga to yeah, but also, and, and, you know, and I think for us, the worrying thing was that there was, because people had time on their hands and people were, it was bringing a whole different group of people into yeah, it. So yeah. in, in in the early days of COVID, a lot of middle-aged women got into conspiracies because it was health, health related. And, and whereas, you know, the men generally, I mean, the polling shows it as well, the men generally are into kind of conspiracies around Muslims and, you know, more more kind of political, overtly uh, 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 political things. But it, it was just such a weird mix. And, you know, and I'd be I'd be out on, you know, in Trafalgar Square and there'd, there'd be people that I would not know, but I would recognise from kind of, you know, left-wing protests or new age protests or whatever you know some of the kind of you know occupy movement sort yeah, of people yeah. and then literally a few few meters away probably unknowingly but a few meters away there were people who were who had been involved with combat 18 and other nazi groups but you know and and i do think that this is a massive challenge not only to kind of government and the police but to society because i think you know the old order of politics is 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 breaking down and a, it's a lot more fluid, but also, you know, it, it's potentially far more dangerous because you don't quite, because at the moment, no one has been able to politicise that movement. I mean, lo, you know, Lawrence Fox has tried to, he's been out in all these protests, but that hasn't worked politically. But, yeah. you know, the numbers of people who are believing in some of these conspiracies is just phenomenal. Mm. And, and of course, for a lot of them, you know, covid passes they get back to their daily lives but 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 we saw some of the we saw some of the consequences at the outset of russia's invasion of the ukraine where overwhelmingly these people and again people who had never been political before um you know i've got these various you know facebook accounts that so you know i'm in a lot of these groups and you look at these people who again from their history had never been active in anything politically before 2020 um, uh, who who were like articulating either it's a deliberate distraction from the global elite to divert away from COVID or, you know, what if they lied to us about COVID, why should we believe them about Putin, mm. whatever. So, mm. you know, it, it plays out in the real world. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's very, um, no, it's, it's so big now um the only (laughs) i was just thinking as you were talking about some of this um there there may be only one saving grace in some of this is that a lot of the people who subscribe to those ideologies for some reason don't like voting um so it might not lead to a coherent political movement just because of that but uh true (laughs) true (laughs) but uh (laughs) there we go um one one looking at sort of just sort of traditional far-right groups um are there? Are you able to sort of give us a guide of just some of the kind of the key groups that maybe have um, certainly exploited some of this online and are benefiting um, from this sort of like kind of the things that we've just been talking about? I mean, are there any kind of big players in the the world of sort of um, kind of neo-Nazi and kind of what we call far-right groups traditionally today? 
Yeah, so I mean, I think probably in terms of organisations, the probably the the main one at the moment is a group called Patriotic Alternative. Um, they are they were founded in 2017, um, 2018 by a man called Mark Collett, who used to be a leading official inside the British National Party, and and in a way they have brought together probably the kind of remnants of the British fascist scene. Um, so so many of their many of their leading activists are former BNP you know organisers and officers. You know with 20, 25 years experience. There's quite a lot of people who used to be in in the now banned uh, uh, national action in it. People who are in kind of blood and honour, the kind of Nazi m- music scene. So they are they are probably the main kind of traditional far right kind of fascist group. And, and they they they've been trying desperately over the last couple of years to to be registered as a political party with the electoral commission. And I think they've tried two or three times and each time that they've been, they've been knocked back, but, but they are, you know, but they are quite openly, you know, Holocaust denial, quite openly racist. Um, and, you know, in a way they they are very similar to, similar to where the BNP were and obviously trying to find, follow that model. You've also, you've also got a group which is, probably ideologically slightly less extreme but fill some of this space called uh, 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 Britain First Le- led my man called Paul Golding and again another former um, BNP officer um, he's he's kind of mixed this kind of anti-Muslim Christian sort of sort of thing and you know anti-immigrant but not necessarily not hardline racist as in kind of you know race science sort of stuff uh but just you know britain has been overrun etc um and you know they are standing in elections uh, but but not 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 doing too well but i mean obviously have you know several hundred supporters uh, around the country and then but i think increasingly we're having these kind of individuals and you know and we we call it the kind of post-organizational far right that the old because of the internet because of podcasts because the ways that people can communicate and can organize these days you don't necessarily need organizations anymore and also because of because of the internet human nature we our own behavior and relation to political involvement has changed and not just on the extremes but across you know people are cherry picking a lot more things that they're interested in and I think, you know, we've seen the rise of what they call citizen journalists, for example, on the far right, who are storming into hotels with, with asylum seekers or, you know, are out on the street. Or, I mean, obviously, then you still have kind of Tommy Robinson and, you know, who, who can still pull out hundreds, sometimes thousands of people out, out on the street. But, I mean, I, th- I think one interesting thing that, that has been happening in recent years is that increasingly the British far right are taking ideas and inspiration from the US, um, and um, you know, and particularly on the more cultural end of, of of the far right, whether it's the anti-Islam stuff or the anti-trans. I mean, more and more the far right are getting quite active and aggressively hostile to the whole kind of you know trans community. But a lot of the material that, that and a lot of the language that they are adopting is coming from 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 the US now and I think you know when we look at the, the even more extreme groups some of whom have been kind of prescribed and literally destroyed by by the security services um you know we are living in a much smaller world and you know it is quite you know it is not uncommon now to see some of these very hard line very small groups literally being internationalist in, in their membership, they might have a leader in Estonia. They might have two people in the UK. They might have someone in Sweden. You know, that's that's the way elements, and particularly the the most extreme end of the far right, is going. It's they see themselves as a world world community now. Yeah, yeah. And is there? I mean, you were saying some of these are not so fixed groups. This question might not necessarily work. But I mean, I've always been fascinated by the funding of sort of far right groups, certainly far right parties as well. I mean, certainly on past podcasts, we've looked at the relationship between sort of Russia funding sort of extremist groups in sort of Western societies with the potential aim to destabilize things. And I don't know if you've seen anything interesting. I mean, so you mentioned the US just now and the ideology from the US. I don't know if you've 
seen any things of substantial about any kind of concerted efforts from um, organisations or governments um, to kind of spread far right ideology. Absolutely, um, and I've got a forthcoming book out, and there is a chapter Ooh. on on how the Russian government mm. and their kind of political propaganda operation mm. have consciously amplified and um, amplified kind of racist and anti-Muslim narratives in yeah. this country, yeah. both around individuals, but in society at large. And that's, that, that has been, and I, I name people in, in, in Russia who've been kind of le- 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 leaving this operation. So, you know, we've certainly seen that. We haven't seen, to my knowledge, funding. Mm. Now, obviously, you know, there are all strange kind of, well, not, not strange, but there are funding relationships between, you know, obviously Le Pen in France and, and Russia and stuff. I mean, it, it would seem to me that the most the British far right gets is the odd air ticket to, yeah. to Moscow. Yeah. So, you know, whether it be Tommy Robinson, whether it be Paul Golding, they they have been invited to Moscow to speak at particular kind of institutes um, in, t- in terms of Paul Golding to speak in the Duma. Um, so they've been hosted by people who are clearly fronts for the, the Russian propaganda um, operation. But there's there's nothing to suggest that, and and that they've also put money there to yeah. hide it from 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 the British. But yeah. it, they've taken money out there. Yeah. There's nothing to suggest that the 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 Russians have funded the far right. Mm. But we can definitely say we can definitely say they have used the British far right to to increase division in society, to amplify disorder, um, and to also an, an, amplify an anti state uh, narrative so yeah. for example there, there was a lot of work when Tommy Robinson was arrested in 2018 uh, for contempt of court when he was filming it, the court case in Leeds um, you know the Russian government and the Russian bot operation were extremely busy amplifying that he was a political prisoner that you know that this is about silencing criticism of it you know of islam and you know we've got all the accounts we can prove that you know the, these were these were russian bots and also you had the kind of russian foreign ministry tweeting out in support of him i say amusingly enough i think it shows where politics is now you also had the son of the u.s president of the united states at that time literally saying exactly the same thing from from across from across the the atlantic so uh, i mean i think that you know um definitely i mean you know and obviously it's it's widely suspected though you know the government haven't launched a big a, a proper investigation into it but you know it's widely widely presumed that the um the russians were amplifying some of the brexit um mm. narrative and mm. and it's about division it's about chaos and yeah. whatever um, we we we've also got another british far right figure an man called jim dowson who's yeah. based in northern ireland a scotsman who was with the with the express and that i've 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 written about this with with the support of um, key figures in the um, Putin um, administration Mm. set up a TV station in Serbia, supposedly to to broadcast into to the um, the Serbian community in the in the US. And again, it was an anti anti-West narrative. Mm. It was about how Western civilization was destroying the family, mm. it was about immigration and everything. So again, you know, c- there is clear evidence that the Russians have tried to exploit the British far right. Yeah, yeah, indeed. What about, is there much, because um, the other thing I've noticed with the American sort of far right ideology and things like that, there seems to be a kind of connection to evangelical Christianity um, and I don't know if you if you have any thoughts on 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 that at all. Yeah, I mean, I mean, to to an extent, I mean, I think you know, Britain is a more of a secular society than 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 the US, and certainly, you know, the far or elements of the far right will sometimes kind of cloak themselves in the language of Christianity yes. as a way to kind of demonize Islam or or raise the threat of Islam. The, you know, they they're not really kind of active in that in that sort of sense like like they are in in the u.s however however and i think again this is one of the concerns for us that as 
some of the kind of political divisions in society kind of follow a cultural line, again, you're starting to see some of these kind of new alliances, new formations going. And they're not necessarily organisational, but they're just echoing the same sort of language. And, and I think, I mean, one of the concerns that we have, which goes beyond the far right, but I think that there has been, or there is, and we saw it in Leicester a few weeks ago, uh, increasing kind of division and splintering between in within both the British Asian but also the wider BAME communities mm. and I mean hope not hate one of our big campaigns many years ago was in 2010 where we led this big campaign in Barking and Dagenham to stop the BNP from taking over the council mm. and in a way we were able to bring together you know West African Muslims, West African Christians, mm, mm. Um, you know, Hindu Sikhs, Muslim communities, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, yeah. against a common a common threat. I think that would be a lot more difficult now because there is both growing antagonism between them, and mm. some of that's historic, going back to India from three hundred years ago. Yeah. But 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 I also think that particularly in over some of the cultural issues, whether it be um, gay rights, whether whether it be trans issues, whether it be critical race theory, there there is in some of the evangelical communities in London, and some some of those are black, some of those are yeah. are, are, are are not black, but there there is a growing politicisation on these cult, cultural cultural issues. Yeah. Where they will play out, I don't know. I mean, clearly, if you have a leadership of the government who are winding stuff up on culture wars for their own political reasons then obviously that will be that will be followed up by the media and that will resonate through society so i don't know how these things will play out but again i think i think the the anti-islam stuff certainly we saw money and ideas come from the u.s into the uk now in the u.s some of that came from the christian evangelical side but um, the British far right has never been that that into religion. No, no. Okay, no. Thank, thank you very much for all that. So, um, since the nine eleven attacks, the UK, US, and European authorities have put a lot of focus and resources to tackle um, Al Qaeda and ISIS inspired terrorism, and many plots were successfully foiled and a few sadly were not since 9-11 has been a growing threat from far-right groups and individuals and um, we famously had the 22nd of july 2011 terrorist attack in norway at the hands of anders brevik and in the uk we've had the murder of labor mp joe cox and there have been many other plots linked to the far right and yet that threat has not been tackled with the same urgency as al qaeda and our isis inspired terrorism so are you able to talk to us a little bit about how far-right terrorism was treated by the authorities maybe prior to the plot against Joe Cox and Rosie Cooper? I think um, and we, we've been very critical of how the authorities have, have, have dealt with the far-right threat. Yeah. I mean, first of all, just, just to say, you know, the far-right threat has never been on the same level as the Islamist Al-Qaeda threat. You know, I mean, the, the idea of these spectacular kind of bombings, bringing down airplanes, you know, blowing up the stock exchange, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I mean, I think it is important to, to say that. And that in itself will mean that that the security services and, you know, counterterrorism will obviously have to grade, grade threats. So on one hand, I, I understand that. Um, however, however, there has been since the early 90s, there has been a, a small but growing wing of the British far right that have ad- advocated terrorism. And again, this, this, the, these are ideas that came into the UK in the early 1990s from the US, the idea of race war. But see, 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 see the difference was, was that it, previously it, there would be individual acts of violence, sometimes extreme violence, sometimes murder against a black person on the street or a Muslim person on, on the street or a firebombing of, fire of the shop. What started to happen post-1991 was that an ideology that came in, which was anti-government, yeah. that, that, that immigration into the, into the UK had been deliberately done by what they call Zog, the Zionist occupation government, the Jewish government, Jewish controlled government, to mongolize the white race. It was all part of the sinister plot. And actually, the main enemy of the far right became the state. And a lot of kind of terrorist ideas came from that. So the targets were, and, and it carries on to, 
to, to this day, and it carries on to Rosie Cooper and um, uh, the plot and, and the murder of Joe, Joe Cox. The targeting figures of the establishment, Anders Breivik, took on what he thought was, what, you know, he took on the elements of the Labour Party, which ran the government, and the, the kind of institutions of government, the government buildings for the, for the car bombs. So we, 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 we've had that. Now, for many, many years, the, um, we would argue that the British security services and the British police and British government underestimated and ignored the threat from the far right. It was on a much, much lower level, but people were talking about it. Uh, I remember in 2014, um, I went to an event, uh, a security conference at Windsor Castle. And um, it was Chatham House, so I'm not allowed to talk about people's names, but there was a very, very senior member of MI5 there who told me and told others um, that he was angry that they were sometimes told that they and MI5 were sometimes told to look at the far right. And he said that it was just liberal politicians, weak liberal politicians who were making the to it. So, and he said, I mean, he was he was spewing out with anger about this, and that the far right were just football hooligans, and it wasn't it wasn't the job of the security services. Now, so I, I I think that you know, I mean, obviously that was him, and he was probably talking off the cuff or whatever. But I think it, it reflected a mood within inside, you know, and so, um, you know, and uh, and. But in in the in the late 1990s and early 2000s, we had a group in this country called Combat 18. The one and the eight came from the first and the eighth letter of the alphabet, A H Adolf Adolf Hitler, who were avowedly terrorist organisation. And actually, their their members, not only in the UK but in over a dozen countries across Europe, have been involved in terrorism and have been involved in plots and you know collecting weapons and etc. Uh, we 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 had a group that and they this group produced would regularly produce magazines that would have bomb manuals in it how to build bombs mm-hmm. it would have targets it would kind of have pictures of black people with bananas mm-hmm. and call them you know most disgusting things yeah. really anti-semitic none of it and they even produce cds you know there was this one cd barbecue in rostock the most extreme cd i've ever seen produced in the world no one ever got prosecuted for these things i mean it was unbelievable mm. that mm. whereas now if this sort of stuff was now you know people would be serving 20 years in, in in kind of prison so i think i think you know i mean obviously there were a number of people arrested during this period i mean the figures were between 1997 and 2001 there were eight far-right activists or sympathizers convicted for terror related offenses and and that's one of the other things because until recently many of the people convicted were never convicted under terrorism so for example you you, you kind of mentioned the walk-in tv program in, in episode one there was a scene where a national action supporter he went into a supermarket in north wales oh yeah um, and, and he actually attacked a sikh man thinking that 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 he was a Muslim in revenge for, for, for Lee Rigby. And he set about him with, with, a uh, with, um, a machete trying to, trying to, um, kill him. This man was not convicted of a terrorist offense. Seriously. Wow. Where, you know, where it was clearly politically motivated. It was done with the intent, you know, it was racist, politically motivated in, in, in retaliation for, for, for Lee Rigby. So, you know, between 97 and 2001, Eight people in those five years, eight, eight people were convicted, eight far right activists convicted between 2002 to 2006, 11 people. If I look at the last um, five years that we have figures for, actually, yeah, five years, 2017 to 2021, 76. 76 people who are far right activists or sympathizers have been convicted virtually all under terrorism legislation. Uh, and I think a few things have happened. One is that the murder of Joe Cox and and then the Darren Osborne, the man who drove a, a, a van into uh, people coming out of a mosque in Finsbury Park in yeah. 2017, that was a massive wake up call. And the the authorities suddenly realized that there was this growing threat from from from, from the far right. Um, secondly, new legislation has been brought in 
and and in a way the terrorism bar has come down now some people might argue it's come down too low whatever but terrorism and so people are now getting convicted for terrorism offenses where they wouldn't have been convicted uh, previously um but i also think that we've seen a big change in the policing um you know and and i think that not not only are they going after the far right and and aggressively going after the far right they're also, and I've had this explained to me, they're also, they've learned the lessons of their failings with Islamist extremism as well. Mm. You know, one of the frustrations from Hope Not Hate and other organizations was that, you know, for many years, you had Anjim Chowdhury, you had Al Majaroon, you had these kind of groups fermenting trouble everywhere they went, you know, encouraging people to travel abroad. But, you know, and I remember... In 2000, between 2010 and 2012, Al-Majaroon would have literally weekly protests outside embassies or places on a Friday lunchtime, Friday afternoon. We, we, we would go down, we'd photograph it. Often, it was literally us and them. There wasn't a single police officer there. And, you know, there was a succession of these kind of groups um, were banned, you know, reincarnations of um, different iterations of, mm. of Al Majaroon at the, mm. you know, successive governments banned. But no one ever got prosecuted for, for membership of these, the, the, these groups. And in a sense, they were waiting for people to actually carry out acts of terrorism and to be in the kind of final, final parts of committing a, a major crime before, you know, the police would, would intervene or arrest them. Two, two things from that. Was and I think the the murder of Lee Rigby was a massive wake up call because again here here were here were two people who had been active for many years in Al Majaroon and other extremist circles without necessarily committing crimes and so there there wasn't proper monitoring of these people and there certainly wasn't monitoring what happens when people left these organisations but but I so I, I I think that 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 was a huge wake up call so. Not only are the police taking the far right threat more seriously, and it has grown mm. internationally, but but also what they've realised that actually, rather than waiting for people to get to serious levels of organising of a terrorist act, you intervene right at the beginning, uh, because by intervening right at the beginning, you are hopefully heading them off to stop them going down that line. And certainly, over the last few years, what we've seen is that people are getting arrested at a very early stage of their involvement in these yeah, groups yeah. Uh, w- without really any kind of discussion about a terrorist act or a violent, violent act, but pure association. Mm-hmm. And, and, that, and that's a very conscious effort to kind of try to nip, nip potential terrorists in the bud. So I think, you know, there, there's some interesting things going on there. Has, um, just out of interest, you talk about nipping things in the bud early on, has the government prevent strategy helped in any way, do you think? I kind of, I think about the prevent thing. Yeah. I, I think that it's, on one hand, it's had a hard, it, it's had a hard press. On the other hand, it's done lots of stupid things. Uh, and then on the other hand, it's on a hiding to nothing as well. You know, at the end of the day, no government plan is going to stop all extremism and stop all the violent extremism. And, and the problem is with prevent, you only need one or two people who go through prevent and it doesn't work for them and they go off to commit a, yeah. an atrocity. Yeah. And everyone says that proves that prevent has failed. You know what I mean? It, it, it's never, it's never going to be 100%. Uh, should, should the government or should any government have a system to try to stop people getting involved in violent extremism and potentially kind of terrorism yes they should because obviously one of the main points of a government is to protect its people and if if the government is seen to lose to lose on that front and not protecting people that's where people will take things into their own hands so it is important i i think though that actually and 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 my big concern at the moment now is you know it's going through a review and you know it's obviously i mean we're uh, not quite sure what will come out of it because obviously we've got a new home secretary but my concern is is that it's going to be kind of ideological led so that there, there, there's been a clear pushback in recent in the last couple of years um from inside and outside the kind of police and security apparatus, but to kind of say we shouldn't be focusing on the far right, we should just be doing Islamist stuff. And so there's that I think there's a real danger that it's going to kind of refocus deliberately, consciously refocus away from the far right back onto 
business extremism. My view, my view is that prevent or whatever it might be called in the future has to be led by the evidence. It should be, it should be ideology blind. You know what I mean? If, if a group, whatever their political viewpoints are planning terrorist actions, that should be a concern, not the, sorry, we've, we've reached our quota for, you know, fascist terrorism. We, we, you know, so I, I think, I think that that's, that's a problem. I think the other, the other difficulty, and this is a much wider difficulty issue than prevent is about the kind of government's counter extremism strategy, partly, Counter extremism and counter terrorism are two different things, and they often get conflated. Um, and secondly, on counter extremism, actually the best defence for countering extremism is within communities themselves, uh, because by the time the police become aware of somebody, often it, it's far too late. And actually, a lot of the intelligence that you know the police or security services get come from leads from within the community. And I think, you know, the problem is there's been too much antagonism between, put ideologically between the government and certain Muslim organisations. It's created a really hostile atmosphere. And yet all the polling, all the polling shows that British Muslims are just, are just as keen to stop terrorism in British society as anybody else. So I think that, to me, counter-extremism, is, it, 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 it's, it's it's a complete mess at the moment, and it's been conflated with counter terrorism. Yeah, and I think yeah. you know that needs a total overhaul. Yeah, yeah, no, indeed. Well, thank you for that. That was because it just popped up in my mind. You talk about, it, and I thought that'd be quite interesting to get your thoughts on that. So, thank you. Well, I hope not. Hate uncovered a far right plot to murder Labour MP Rosie Cooper, and that's now become a, a really good ITV drama called The Walk In. So, uh, Nick, can you talk to us a little bit about this plot and then how it sort of ended up becoming a, a TV drama. Sure. So um, I guess best place to start is uh, December 2016, when the then then Home Secretary Amber Rudd announced um, that National Action, a British um, Nazi group, was going to get prescribed. And this was the first far right group to be prescribed since World War Two. And I think this this was largely in reaction to both the, the murder of Joe Cox MP, but also the kind of glorification of this murder by by national action members and you know the encouragement to to do similar things what actually then happened and i think this this highlights some of the kind of policing issues that and, and the failings that we we talked about earlier what actually happened is then the the authorities banned this group and then took their eye off the ball thought it thought it had disbanded and of course it hadn't disbanded it reorganized um, and it had a new leader, which, which the police, you know, the police had, had never heard of before, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a few months later, so in April 2017, a young man inside National Action, uh, one of their kind of prominent people up in the Northwest, contact, contacted us, um, first of all, um, anonymously, basically saying that he was worried where this group was going, that the group was still organizing, still active, still meeting every single week, still training, um, boxing and martial art training. And he was basically saying, look, if I stay in this group, I'm going to, I'm going to get killed or I'm going to end up in prison because that, that is, that is the direction of, of this group. Yeah. Um, we had a number of meetings with him and obviously it was fascinating for us because he was telling us about a group that we didn't really have much information on, particularly post post ban. Um, and then in early July, 2017, he contacted a colleague of mine to say that he had been at a pub, um, the previous evening where a young man called Jack Renshaw told the others that he was plotting to kill his local MP. And in a way, he was getting their kind of sign off and, and approval. Um, he, there was a conversation about targets and some of them were saying, why are you going for your local MP? Why, why don't you go for the Home Secretary? Or why, why don't you attack a local synagogue and you know, stuff? But um, he was obviously insistent he wanted to get the local MP. He then wanted to um, well, first of all, he'd take the MP hostage and he would insist that um, so he kill the MP. He would take, he'd take some people hostage, then insist a police officer who was investigating him came to negotiate 
at which point he he then had this idea that he would swap the hostages for her and then his idea was 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 to kill her his his aim really was to be killed himself he had a he, he had built this kind of uh dummy uh, uh bomb vest and he thought that he would then be shot shot dead by by police so he he told his friends this plot our informant told us um and instantly we knew that we had to go to the police about this yeah, and we instantly said to him his life was going to change because we couldn't hold this information because basically the by the sound of it by the sound of it the plot was days away from happening he had scoped out the constituency office he knew her movements and uh, time was of the essence so as a result of that um, I took the information into the authorities and fortunately they acted on it quite quickly. He was obviously arrested and then at trial, surprisingly, he then pleaded guilty uh, to the plot plot to murder. Mm, mm. And was he, I think when I was watching the TV drama, when he pled guilty, was he um, hoping that that would get more press than the allegations of um, paedophilia that were against him? Yeah, see, I mean, I, I think this is really interesting because mm. I think that if we figure out his motivations, mm. um, it's that mixture of politics and personal. And yeah. I think, I mean, I'd say I've done this a long time now mm. and I, I've seen this all all the way through. Um, and so for Jack Renshaw, Jack Renshaw was one of the kind of hard, most hardline national action um, leaders prior to the ban, you know, I mean, you know, he was very, very young, but he was a very good speaker. Mm. And, you know, we'll talk about exterminating the Jews. And, you know, I mean, he, he did this thing in Blackpool on Blackpool Beach in front of the, surrounded by about 30 to 40 police officers where he talked about the Jewish vermin and that Jew, that Jew, you know, hit, hit, Hitler was soft on the Jews and that you know, they should be exterminated. Mm. And, you know, 18 months later, the CPS were still deciding whether, whether to prosecute him for this for this speech. So on one hand, he was a political hardliner. What the others didn't know, what his friends didn't know, is that as he was being investigated for, for that racist speech and another one he did in Yorkshire, um, the police found on his mobile phones or in his computers, they found he had been interacting and grooming young boys. And he... He was charged with, I think, three offences on, on, of, of, of grooming, grooming boys. Mm. And to be honest, I and I, I remember speaking to the police about this at the time, and I spoke to the um, TV people. I was really, I was really strongly in belief that he decided to kill an MP and then hopefully be killed himself in a blaze of glory, so he would be remembered as a, a in their terms, white jihadist, mm. a white hero, mm. rather than being being known in prison as 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 a sex offender. Yeah, uh, he was petrified of going to prison. Yeah, be, you know because of that. So I think that, but again, you know, this isn't totally uncommon. I remember going back to two thousand and one, where we had David Copeland, um, and we talked about earlier terrorism. I mean, David Copeland becomes London bomber. In 1999, he planted bombs in Brixton, Brick Lane, and Soho. Um, he was inspired by this combat 18 propaganda that no one had been prosecuted for. Um, he was partly motivated. I mean, so the, the kind of bombing in Soho, which killed three people and injured dozens of more, was because, you know, here, here was a young man who had never had a girlfriend who was convinced that people thought he was gay. And so by blowing up a gay bar in london that would be the best way to show that he wasn't gay so this mixture of personal and political is very in intertwined why mm. people get involved in the first place mm, mm, no indeed indeed what was it um like going through the process of turning this into a tv drama i mean it was a very it was a very long process i mean i'm sure you probably know don't know this yourself yeah. i mean i think the the first discussions were probably in the summer of 2019 oh wow yeah, yeah. um yeah. i mean partly partly covid but mm. i mean it was um it was a very long long process and it was all secret kept under wraps i mean even at even at hope not hate there were only only a few of us who knew about it we all you know we all had to sign these you know confidentiality things mm. and they were worried about security etc so you know i mean it was a very long process so you know i mean on one hand there was a bit of a relief when when the drama actually finally came out yeah 
um i mean my my kind of character is quite funny because i just always seem to be eating i seem to have this little <laughs> fridge i seem to have this yes. little fridge behind my desk which yes. is full of little snacks and you know <laughs> whatever which I, you know just just for the record i i do not have a fridge um behind my desk but um no i mean it, look i mean it's great i mean like i say it's great i mean it's obviously it, 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 it it's a dark drama you know yeah. it's uncomfortable watching at times it's very honest and you know particularly about my colleague Matthew who yeah, Stephen Graham yeah, plays you know yeah. you know because his own background and why he got involved in the far right and you know which was basically you know he was a young man as a 13 year old was a bit wayward at school but his his dad who you know I mean <laughs> his dad was very racist began having an affair with the black babysitter and you know and that caused the family break up and you know and it and it caused my colleague then to get involved with with the national front and you know and, and so I, th- I think you know the drama is sometimes uncomfortable and difficult mm. watching but mm. actually i think you know it, it it's all the better for for it as well well definitely and i think what i liked about it in particular was the um i don't know if redemption is the right word but how people can change because there's one thing that's grown i think on the left when talking about people who have um sort of uh who when reacting to people with extreme ideas they feel like those people have become irredeemable and there's Mm -hmm. no hope for them and and i kind of always feel a bit like um i i've of the opinion that everybody nobody's irredeemable um uh to a point you know unless they murder someone i guess that's probably a point where you might have to say that's they've crossed the line way too far but you know um i'm always fascinated about can people be brought back from the brink and i think that drama showed that pretty well i think because it's not a perfect uh for is it robbie robbie doesn't you know yeah. he, he didn't completely get rid of his sort of racist views um but it, it, it but he certainly he has changed a bit by the end of the process so i suppose yeah i, I found that really great for that yeah and, and i think i think that's a really interesting point you made because i think that you know and, and we saw this particularly after the brexit referendum the the you know that actually both the polarization in society mm. and the kind of unforgiving view about the other people uh, but also kind of progressives liberals whatever you want to term them the the, the remainers became the angry people and again our poll our polling showed this they became very unforgiving of the mm. other side and mm. i think that you know it is so important a people do change and people can change and it's about helping them on their path and i think that's why when we do our you know we, we we've just established a a de-radicalization unit here because we're saying that actually you know you need to help people on the journey it can't just be law and order you don't stop extremism by having laws but what was interesting about robbie this was that i was chatting to him last week and um i, j- I just watched the whole drama i mean I, I i've seen the drama a few months ago but i just watched the whole drama again and i just sent him a message straight after just saying look really proud of what you've done i know you know your life's been turned upside down whatever and he actually replied to me saying that for the first time, hand on heart, he's saying, I now am totally the opposite of that person now. He goes, it's taken the drama being on TV and watching it play out. And, you know, because as, as you say, I mean, obviously, you know, preempting the end of the drama, but it just it does show a change in a person. But at the end of the day, his life both fundamentally hasn't changed but also in many ways it's got worse because of all this i mean mm. it had a, it had a huge impact on him and he lost his job and mm. he had to move house and you know whatever but you know and he's constantly looking over his shoulder but at the end of the day both back at the time um i mean i i remember we had a couple of colleagues at work who kind of said yeah but what are, what are his views on immigration what are his views on this or that and i kind of said it doesn't really matter because this this young man who left school at 14 with no qualifications, whose dad died when he was 14, kind of lived, moved around from the age of 15, had no real friends. And part that's why part he got involved in the far right in the first place and found a family. He had to make a decision that none of us will have to make, hopefully. And he he, he knew right and wrong. And whether he still holds some negative views around immigration or this or that, you know, in a way is immaterial. When it came to the big question, he was willing to put himself on the line 
to save the life of the others. And I remember back at the time, he said to me once, he said, he said, look, if nothing else happens in my life, he goes, I can always look back and I've saved someone's life. And that's how he views it. And I, I kind of feel, and first of all, I think he has now, uh, he has progressed way more than even in that drama. Um, he's unfinished work and, and he knows that and he's complicated and because of his life, he'll get, have his ups and downs mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I think that unless we can offer hope to people we can never really pull people away because i think the other thing that people forget is it is really difficult to leave an extremist group you know and i think you know when we again go back to prevent or whatever part of the problem is that you can't you can't just have a law and order approach because this this is about psychology this is about human beings this is about a sense of belonging and identity we 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 had an awful time with the police in the weeks after um going going to the police around this partly it was turf wars partly it was kind of you know you know particularly kind of london counter-terrorism upset with us that we had stuff that you know whatever but i mean part of it also was about robbie because they said oh they wanted him to go into witness protection yeah and basically they said to him that meant he would have to change his name break away from his family have no connection to his family they'd put him up in a flat somewhere else in the country give him money for two years at the salary that he was on before, which was a warehouse job, oh, which was a low paid yeah. salary. Yeah. And basically they wouldn't be able to do anything else. Yeah, and good. in mm. the end with us, a, we offered him more because, and it wasn't about money. It was about, we offered him a family. We had people checking in him every day. He came to events with us, mm. you know, and, and, and I remember at the trial talking to a couple of the police officers to, you know, hadn't been the ones who were really antagonistic, but obviously they'd been involved from the beginning. Mm. And they basically said to me, they they were talking. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I'll give you an example. Yeah. Dublin. So in in the drama, Matthew Matthew takes Robbie to Dublin. Yeah. And the police could not figure out why we were doing that. Who were we meeting there? What was in Dublin that we were going to do? Yeah. And I mean, actually, I mean, I went on the trip as well. It didn't have it in the drama, but. Robbie, Robbie didn't have a passport. He'd never been out of the country in his mm, life before. Mm. He'd hardly ever been out of the area where, where he'd never been to London. He hadn't done any of these things. And the stress of it all, the stress of, you know, for him being a rat and informing on his friends or, you know, the stress of the police and everything. And the police would take, take him away for three days at a time and interrogate him in these kind of, you know, windowless rooms up in, up in the Northeast or whatever. I mean, it was... It was incredibly stressful. We went away just for a fun weekend and we went round on the tourist bus in Dublin. <laughs> we went to the bars, yeah. you know, but yeah. And the police couldn't understand why, because it wasn't in their textbook. And it was about building relationships. And the police said to me at the trial, the, 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 the police said, they, they we were chatting away about it. By this time, we were all friends and, you know, we'd got, you know, Renshaw had been pretty guilty, et cetera. So we, we'd got the result. But the police said to me, he goes, the policeman said to me, he goes, actually, I understand now why Robbie stuck with you and didn't come with us, because you actually offered him more than we were able to offer him. Because all they could do was financial, you know, and there was no care, there was no looking after. And I think, you know, I meet some of these people, Robbie included, and, you know, they are desperately vulnerable people. Um, I mean, we, 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 we've just done a piece of work with a young man from South Yorkshire who's got cerebral palsy, unbelievably badly bullied at school to the point that he kind of built his school on Minecraft with the intention of going to kill. So he could go from classroom to classroom to kill his bullies. Oh gosh. Yeah. And you know, he took a knife into school one day. Fortunately he didn't do it. He then joined the far right. And you know, he spent three years in the far right before realizing it was wrong. And we told his story because it was like society often would see the end result, whether, I mean, thank God he didn't do anything in the school, but that or being involved in the far right. But actually, his story started many years before when he was relentlessly bullied at school to the point that he wanted to take his own life or or or, or take their lives. And I think that sometimes we have to 
take away the political labels from people and just see people for individuals as well yeah yeah indeed indeed thank you so much for your time today it's been really great to have you on no i've 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 really enjoyed it and uh, you know i shall keep listening to the podcast and i should urge everyone to support the podcast as well thank you well where, where can listeners find out more about you and your work so you can go to the hope not hate website mm-hmm. hope not hate.org.uk you can follow me on twitter yep. lols l-o-w-l-e-s underscore nick yeah and then i've got a new book coming out in middle of november um Excellent. just called tommy yeah cool well thank you nick that's been great yeah no worries listening. This is Secrets and Spies. 